y'all doing tonight? Y'all ready to experience the Lord? All right, let's open up in prayer. God, I thank you so much for just bringing us all here tonight, Father. I thank you for bringing us together. I just thank you for revealing yourself to us, God. And I just pray that as we seek you together, God, I ask you to just bring us into unity, God. And we ask you to reveal yourself to us in a powerful way, Father. And we just ask you to transform every person that's not tonight, God. And I just ask you also just to... Uh, just guide the words that Todd is going to have for us tonight, Father. I ask you to use him to just touch us, Father, and just teach us how to take your love to the streets, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 In my church, we say, praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Come on, let everyone who has breath praise the Lord. And then we can come and just look at each other and what's going on.
warriors in the audience to help us out with this song tonight. Ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me of his prisoners, but be thou 
partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Hallelujah! spirit of loneliness, against the spirit of lustful desires, lustful thoughts, against the spirit of sickness, against the spirit of fornication, against the spirit of the mind games, and my scripture is coming from Galatians 5, and it says, for the, for the flesh lust is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to the other, and so that you cannot do the things that you would, but if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uh, lovelessness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, enemies, murders, drunkenness, rebellion, and such like of this, which I tell you before, as I have told you in the, in, the, in the time past, that ye which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So I declare war against all. Revival! 
you peace. I declare war on all anxiety and depression. Get out. Come with me, peace. So 
But I thank the Lord because he's so true and he's faithful. And just being here tonight, um, you know, the past year has been really interesting. I attended the University of Kentucky as an undergraduate. Um, I majored in a few things and I graduated. <laughs> and then I went to Louisville and obtained a master's degree in the counseling field. And then I returned to the University of Kentucky after a season of prayer and fasting. Um, during my master's, I felt like the Lord was telling me he wanted me to come back and attend the College of Law, so I did, and I did it in his name. And I just remember um, the pressure of just that pressure that says law has to be your God if you're going to be successful. If you're going to be successful academically, you have to worship your intellect. You have to bow at the idol of your degree, bow at the idol of your professional aspirations. But I just thank the Lord that he, he gave me a vision that his blood would speak a better word even in that even in that circumstance. And I just thank him because in that place, even though war was, was founded during my undergraduate um, time here, when I was in law school, he began to open doors for it to come to this campus. And um, I remember that first night that we gathered for services. And um, the Lord had given me just this vision based out of Second Chronicles 7, 14 about him healing our land and about him reconciling uh, just this land that had been so riddled with sin and, uh, and lust and, and discord, dissension, certain ideologies and just self-exalting. And he just showed me a vision of how unadulterated worship, anointing, and revival would bathe this land and its purpose and it would reconcile it back to God. And I don't know if you, if you think that makes sense or not, but I just remember that vision and we're here. And I remember looking out that first service and seeing like deans from the College of Law, seeing professors, seeing sworn atheists here. And I was just like, wow, God. I was like, you're really doing something. And we've been here for a few years doing this ministry, but uh, I find myself just returning to that same idea. I graduated in 2013 from law school, so I was in college for eight years. Thank you, Jesus. And um, so, so yeah, after eight years, I graduated, and um, the Lord allowed me to have a job. And, and I worked full-time as an attorney um, here in Kentucky for the circuit court. Um, God blessed me to pass the bar and to continue ministry, continue to war. But then, just like last fall, I felt this restlessness in my, in my heart. And I just was like, God, I've just always wanted to, and you know, you can minister in the marketplace. I did, and I will, you know, but, but I just wanted to do it differently. And I was like, God, if I could just still live from this for a season and, um, and just really lend my time without, without the interruption of this job for, for a season, if you would let me, uh, if you would lead me in that, I, I would like to. And God just graced me and he allowed me to just, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't, it wasn't like some of the stories I hear, but I literally just, it was on my heart, and I just felt grace to do it. So I saved up my money, and I just left. And I was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I went to Kenny on a mission trip and preached the message of war, actually, by an invitation that I received in Power and Love last year. I was sitting by this woman, and she just turned over, uh, turned around and sent, gave me her business card, and I gave her the war ministry card that I carry. And she was like, oh, you should bring this message to Kenya. And I was like, really? Because I've been praying for like six years to go back. I've been to Ghana, and I was like, Lord, will you, can I, I want to go back to, you know, Africa and minister some more. And um, that door just blew wide open during the conference last year. I was like, okay, Jesus. So I, I kind of completed my contract at my job at that time, and I chose not to, you know, compete to extend it. And I just kind of prepared for that season in Kenya. And after ministering, I felt just like grace, continued grace to kind of go and minister um, in Missouri. So I did, and I just kind of ministered in the house of prayer during the night watch and did some other things. And I returned just like a little over a month ago. So coming back home has been just like, it's been, you know, wonderful. But I feel like I've been catching up like with all the things that have been happening here. But when the Lord just made it clear that we were supposed to do this this night and just contend again for the healing of the land. I'm so grateful how, you know, sometimes you'll have this idea that your ministry or like its growth is about you or what you do or you being present. I just thank God how he allowed like the war to grow in my absence because it's not about me, it's about him. And he'll advance it the way he wants to, he'll establish it the way he wants to. So um, I just wanted to give God glory and just, he is the Lord of this city. He's the Lord of this campus. And And to those who are still in college here, I just want to commend you. Don't bow down to the idol of your intellect. 
don't bow down to the idol of, of your degree pursuit. And by no means am I saying those things aren't important. I did that. I, I graduated with honors. I, it mattered to me, and I did it in the name of the Lord. I believe in glory for him. But it's so much bigger than that. And, you know, our theme for this year is Revelation 22, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride are saying, come. You know, all who are thirsty, come. All who are searching, come. Like there's a river that will not run dry, but if you drink of this water, you're gonna thirst again. But if you drink of the living water of Jesus Christ, you are not gonna thirst. He's gonna satisfy you more than that relationship will. He's gonna satisfy you more than that degree ever could. He's gonna satisfy you more than popularity will. If you just steal away and make him the priority, make the one thing the one thing. Behold his beauty, inquire of him, ask him questions, let him lead in your life. He will be faithful. Just want to encourage someone today not to bow, not to bow to bow, because it's a war of worship that we're in. And uh, God is strengthening his bride to declare his name. So let's just shout the name of Jesus. Stages on street corners and declaring the word of Jesus. 
and we took it to Kenya, we'll take it to Costa Rica, like we just go over call, um, but that does cost money. God has provided, but we're going to ask that you allow them to use your hands to do that tonight. So, I'm going to take a moment and pray, and I'm going to ask that those who are going to collect offering to come up so we can instruct everyone. And just give our, give our more volunteers a hand. So what if you're not supposed to be on the defense? What if it's not about your strength? What if it's about his strength within you? What if God is truly for you? Who can be against you? Our God is mighty to save. Our God is mighty to If you've got a problem with them and them and them, it's not them, it's you. If you got a problem with this one and this one and this one, it's not them, it's you. Look in the mirror. Jesus paid a price to set us free from us so we can truly be free. Your salvation your joy, your peace doesn't depend on your circumstances. It depends upon who you put your faith in, who you put your trust in, who you put in first place. Jesus reigns in me. Does he reign in you? Does he reign in you? Does he reign in you? Don't be deceived. Don't get it twisted. It's not about us. It's all about him. Why should we be offended when people don't know what they're doing? Our war is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual hosts of wickedness in dark places. Your war is not against people. People aren't your problem. Why don't you walk and shine as light in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation? Why don't we walk like Jesus? He wasn't influenced by his surroundings, but he was a light in the darkness. Why don't we let that light shine into our hearts and create in us a clean heart, a new heart, a new creation? All things have passed away, all things have become new. Jesus set me free from me, which makes me free from you. He paid a price to set me free from sin. He paid a price to set me free from gossip, from complaining from criticism, from being hurt and offended. He paid a price to set me free from setting up boundaries so I could be protected from you. What if that's the truth? What if we're the problem and people are hard? God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son so whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life starts when you say yes to Jesus. Eternal life is no.
And Jesus Christ, the one who the Father sent to redeem those that were lost. No matter what you do, no matter what you think you were worth the cost. What if your value isn't determined by what your mom and dad said? What if your value was determined by the blood that Jesus bled? What if your value was determined by Jesus Christ who was sent? He saw our condition and then he went to redeem us from ourselves so that we could give the devil a bad day every day. beautiful and if you see it you'll be free how many of you have never heard me before yay <laughs> what you think <laughs> I don't know what's going on it's like a theater show or something <laughs> for those of you that don't know I was a drug addict for 22 years and an atheist and I hated the church couldn't stand the church. They were all about themselves, all about praying prayers that didn't change them. That's what I thought, I promise you. How many of you came in here an atheist? Come on, raise your hand. Little kid, little three year old. <laughs> mine, mine, mine. <laughs> How many of you came in here not a believer for real? I want to know. Come on, be bold. Raise your hand. Oh, chicken. <laughs> You'd ask me and I told you. I'd have told you. No one asked me ever. You know, for 34 years, I, no one ever told me the gospel. No one shared Jesus with me. Everybody was about their own thing. 34 years of my life, no one shared the gospel with me. Nobody did. I guarantee you I walked by an evangelist. I guarantee you I walked by a Christian. That's for sure. Guarantee I used to hear Christians pray. I used to hear Christians complain. I used to hear, I used to hear Christians talk about this. I used to see them. They come from church. They'd be yelling at their wife in the restaurant, man. What you got? That doesn't make you different than the world. It makes you just like the world. Sometimes we're in this war and we're warfare and we want to like change things. We want stuff to change. And we're trying to pull down stuff and we're against this and against that and against that. And I'm not, I'm not telling you that it's wrong to contest that this is wrong and have rallies because it's right. But if you, if you get into the word of God and you find out what God says about you, you'll find out that all these thoughts that you've been thinking might not be okay. And the word of God changes you inside. He changes your heart. He changes everything inside. He does. I promise you, he changes everything. This is total scripture. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And it's warfare. It says that. Well, we don't warfare. We don't, we don't fight as one beats the air. We don't fight as somebody that's just shadow boxing. It's not about shadow boxing. You be very careful that you don't enter into spiritual warfare and get worn out by the enemy. And come out of the war out. You better war from the place of rest. You better war from the place that the cross has paid a price for us to enter into. Because we war from rest, not from stress. We don't war because we have a problem. We're from victory. We're not supposed to set our minds on the things of the earth and pray for Jesus to return. This thing is not okay. It's not okay for you to pray for Jesus to get you out of here. Let me tell you what happens. See, see, life is hard. Jobs get bad. Families, they get rough. And what happens? And I've heard people pray. Like, God, I can't believe it. I'm reading the Bible. I read the, the end. I read Revelation. I read, I'm reading this and, and Timothy and... My gosh, God, people be lovers of themselves and not lovers of God, lovers of money, haughty, not honoring their parents. 
Just the very fact that you would pray for Jesus to rescue you out of here means that you're a lover of yourself. Think what you want. I promise you that's the truth. Why? Because if you pray for Jesus to get you out of here, I know a lot of people that ain't ready yet. What good is it for you to get inside of your prayer closet and pray for Jesus to rescue you out of here and position yourself for the rapture as a rescue mission when the rapture is not a rescue mission, it's to pick up for a wedding date the bride has made herself ready for? But when you get saved and then all of a sudden you come into the church and you position yourself to hide inside the four walls and contest and war from within here but not do anything with this thing. What you're doing is you're saying, God, it's really bad. I'm telling you, my job is my job is bad. Income is bad. I can't pay my bills. My family's mean. My boss is a jerk. God, it's the sign of the last times. I pray Jesus get me out of here to heaven with me and to hell with the world. That's not me. That's the Bible. Jesus said, you know, God, I, I pray that you don't take the disciples out of here, but I pray that you protect them from the evil one. He didn't say, take them out of here, God. No, he left them here to finish the job. And we've got a job to do, guys. It's a job that we get to do out of love, not out of striving, not out of stress, not out of works, but out of rest and out of grace through faith. And we get to witness and share the love of God wherever we go. Man, I went to a restaurant last night just to hang out, just to... I think it was last night. No, maybe it was the night before. I don't know. I think it was last night. I went to Olive Garden just to get some salad. And it was empty. Where's my Olive Garden peeps that are here? Look at that. Come on. For real. That's awesome. Just one visit. I'm going. I'm going to go hang out. Why? Because Jesus is wonderful. He's attractive. He's lovely. He's beautiful. Everybody wants to hang around Jesus except people that think they know it all. Here's my question. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy 3.12. It says all of those that desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Here's a good place to check and see where your life is. When's the last time you got persecuted? That's not me. That's the Bible. I'm not persecuted for bringing the hammer on people. Persecuted for living godly. Do you know that the miraculous is scary to a lot of the church? Yet the Bible says it's supposed to be ordinary. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the one. It's the Spirit of God. He's the Spirit of truth. But you can't take the word without the truth and bring them together. You need to bring spirit and truth together because he's the Spirit of truth. That's what changes. That's what changes people. It's not theory. It's an active relationship with the one that wrote the book. It's awesome. Man, my life was twisted. Just a real short cap of it. If I can do it. Think I can? Okay. Some of you need faith. No, some of you heard me preach before. It's just so good. Why? Because never forget where you came from. Never. At 11 and a half years old, my mom and dad put me in a children's home called the Masonic Homes. I was raised by the Freemasons. So at 17 years old, I get kicked out of there. I come home and I'm just lost, man. I started drugs at 12 years old, full on. And I joined the Marine Corps because they wanted a few good men and I wasn't a man, but I was going to prove that I was. Yeah. Ooh, so I went into Marines. I did. With an authority problem. A major authority problem. And I had a big mouth. And so by the end of boot camp, I lost 73 pounds. In a few weeks. I had a big mouth. I couldn't shut up. God gave me a mouth for a reason, but I didn't know how to use it yet. Now I shouted from the rooftops. But then I was destructive. So I ended up coming home from boot camp and my mom was like, wow, you changed. You're a different man. This is awesome. Proud of you, son. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and then I went home, went back on base, started partying, started drinking. I realized, you know what? I don't really want to be here anymore. So I said, I want to go home again. They said, sorry. I said, see ya. And I went AWOL, ran away from the military. That does not work at all. <laughs> and I went home. I told my mom I got to leave again because something was fishy and they knew it. So I had to get out. So I stole a bunch of money from a drug dealer 
and I went out west to the mountains. And I got a job out there. Then I got busted. Then I got arrested. Then I got put in jail. Then I got extradited across America and put in the Marine Corps prison down there at Camp Lejeune. And I was in there for about eight and a half months. And I got out of the, of, the, of the prison and they put me on base awaiting orders. And I didn't want to wait, so I left. Made my own orders. And I ran away again to the same place I got arrested at before. Not smart. I get busted about, about a year later. They put me in jail. They cuff me. They extradite me again in an orange jumpsuit across America to the military prison in Camp Lejeune again. Welcome back, Todd. About nine months later or so, give or take a couple of weeks, they let me out, but this time I wasn't gonna wait. They kicked me out and gave me a bad conduct discharge. That marks you forever. So I didn't know what to do, so I came home. Couldn't get jobs and tell the truth, so I lied to get jobs. So that's what I did in my life. Man, wouldn't it be an awesome thing if a Christian would have interrupted me on my path and wouldn't be so consumed with their own life that they actually cared to lay down their life for someone else? But no one did. And I'm not mad at the church. I'm just hoping to convict your heart enough that you dare to tell somebody about your faith instead of keeping it in there with a basket on your head. That's not me. That's just the real deal. We're not supposed to be quiet. You're supposed to preach the gospel to all creation. Doesn't mean you need to stand on a chair and shout the reality of Jesus Christ died for everybody. You, you can. That's awesome too. But you don't have to. You don't have to clobber the head, clobber somebody over the head with it. You don't have to headlock them and say submit. You don't have to, you don't have to try to scare them and give them a get out of hell free card. Because it's not about just escaping hell. It's about bringing heaven here. Hell is real. Please don't think that I'm saying it's not because Jesus talked about it more than anybody did. Hell is real. This world is not hell. There is a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and it is a reality. And everybody that you walk by every day is eternal. They're either headed there or they're headed there. Period. There is no in between. There's not some place to hang out. It either, it's either there or it's not there. Hell or heaven, heaven or hell. Jesus said for or against, gather or scatter. There is no in between. He said to the church, he said, I wish that you were either hot or cold. That's what he said, hot or cold. I thought it was weird at first when I, when I read that, hot or cold, okay. That's weird because warm he doesn't like at all. What is warm? Mm. Cold is somebody like me. See, I was freezing cold. And then Jesus went, boom, 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 and translated me out of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and into the sun of his love, and into the sun of his light, into the sun. He translated me, and I didn't stop in between. Hot isn't just somebody that has zeal. Hot is somebody that's on fire. On fire is like this. If I poured a quart of gasoline on your head, and lit you on fire. You could care less about what anybody thinks about you. <laughs> All day long. <laughs> Some of you were like, that man is out of his mind. What if I'm just out of yours? <laughs> what if I live for me my whole life and I'm just done living for me? What if I gave myself completely to this and I didn't stop in between? See, Jesus says, but because you're warm, I'll spit you out. I said, God, why would you spit out people that at least know that you're real? He said, Todd, because they're a damage to the world around them. Man, I live every day. I teach my, I teach my kids, live every day, every day, like there'll be no tomorrow. Live every day that you're going to stand before the Lord one day, and he's going to say, well done. Every day, that's your focus. Behold the Lamb. That's everyone's privilege. You guys okay? It was cool when he was singing. Now he's meddling. No, I'm not. We're just getting started. I'm sharing the truth. And it's spoken in love because none of you can hear me clobbering you in the head with it. Because I love you. You know why? Because I would lay my life down for any of you. I promise you, because I already surrendered my life to Jesus. 
and I haven't taken it back. Because I've offered my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is my only reasonable and pleasing service to the Father. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that everywhere you go, you can prove the will of God. Everywhere you go. No matter where you go, you can prove the will of God. Everywhere. So I'm lost. Back then, twisted. Get kicked out, come home. Can't get jobs. So I do, because I lie on every application. I get jobs, I quit, get fired. I sell drugs, I buy drugs. It's just twisted, man. Then I meet this girl and I trick her into thinking, I am a cool dude. Because I'm a slip talker, I'm a con artist, I'm a drug dealer. I'm a manipulator and a maneuverer. Man, and I grew up that way. And I was good at what I did. I was a thief, a professional thief. Steal, kill, destroy, that was mine. That was who I was. I'm not talking to you from somebody that grew up in church and grew up in the gospel. How could I grow up in something that nobody ever shared with me? I meet this girl, we move in together, I trick her into think I'm a cool guy. We got a lot in common because we're both atheists. She's a, she's a passive one, but I'm an aggressive one. Then about a year and a half later, we end up having a daughter, a little girl. And my little girl comes out and I realized I could never be a dad. How am I gonna be a dad? I don't even know. My dad wasn't there for me. How am I gonna be a dad to this one? This is responsibility. What am I gonna do? <clears throat> so I just got high, so I got drunk, so I partied hard to get my mind off of life because life was a, was a fake and I was a fake. And I remember it was up because now I have a kid. Now I gotta provide and I can't provide. I don't know how to provide. And I don't know the provider. I have no idea who I am. And I'm running around with a lost identity. And my identity is an orphan. And I have no clue who I am or why I'm on this earth. And man, my daughter suffered for that. And finally, my girl was like, I'm done with you. I'm out. I said, if you leave me, I'll kill myself. And she'll have no father. So she stayed with me. And then it was too much. And she said, I'm done. I'm going to find somebody that's going to take care of me. I said, if you leave me, I'll kill whoever you're with and you. I'll kill them first and then you. And you'll watch and then I'll kill myself and our kid will be left with nobody. That's how, how the selfish is that. And I thought that way. Jealousy, rage, and suicide. How many people in here have ever thought of suicide before? Raise your hand. Come on. It's a dominant issue all over the world. It's for real. The devil wishes he could commit suicide, but he can't. He wishes he could be done with his life, but he can't. He's finished forever. He's hopeless, depressed, angry, bitter, ashamed, afraid, in unforgiveness. Comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he tries to recreate his mindset in the body of Christ. Because if he can get you captured here, but get you to confess here, but be captured here, he'll keep you bound for life. And you'll never do anything with what God's created you to have. Because he's created you in the likeness and in the image of him. And what we lost in the garden, God regained through Christ. He paid a price to seek and to save that which was lost. And that was us. To restore our identity as sons and daughters to an amazing father. Jesus paid more of a price than just to get you there. He paid a price to get heaven into you. It's the joy of your salvation. And salvation isn't just beat me up out of here. Salvation is the Greek word called soteria. The word say it doesn't even mean get to heaven, get me out of here. The word, the word sozo is from the word saved. It's saved, healed, delivered, made whole, protected, to be kept safe from harm, to do well. That's what that word means. But we translated it into the English. So you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. That means saved, healed, delivered, protected, made whole, kept safe and sound, and do well to be kept safe from harm. That's what the word means. But we've defined it through our experience. We've defined it through just getting people to pray a prayer instead of the reality of what they've prayed themselves into and what they've given themselves completely to. 
but we've sold people short for this thing and we've moved on to the next one to try to get them to pray a prayer. But what if it's not just about the prayer? What if it's about a communion relationship with the living God? Every day. Every day. It's just good gospel truth. Yay. You okay? Lighten it up a little. Guys, this is good news. I know it seems seems like a, a pointed word, but it's in love. We can't afford to let the baton drop. We can't afford to let the ball drop. We need to know who we are, wherever we are. People are dying to hear the good news. Man, all creation is groaning for the sons and daughters of God to be made manifest. You know, the groaning of creation doesn't sound like you think it sounds. Sometimes we think that the groaning of creation is, oh, tell me about the Lord. That's not how it works. How about this? Shut up and get out of my face. I don't believe anything you say. Oh, they're just groaning. What if that's groaning right there? What if we just take it wrong? Come on, man. We need to run. We need to stop being afraid. We need to stop hiding. We need to take the basket off. Not just be about a service, but be the church. Walk and live. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Be the eyes of Jesus, the words of Jesus, the love of God. We need to see our creative value and understand who we are. When you look in the mirror, you should know who you are looking at. A daughter, a son, one that God loves. God loves you, man. God's going to give you faith to change the Muslim communities, man. I promise you. I don't even know who you are, but I can see it over you. I can see you going into Muslim sections, and I can see people coming to Christ because of your life. You Christian. You Muslim. Where are you? Are you a Christian? Yes? What favor he's placed on you, man. I see your extended family coming to Jesus, man. Getting wrecked with the gospel. Who? Oh, God is so good. I promise. He's ridiculously amazing. Thank you. If you play, you lighten it up a little. Music helps it go down easier. <laughs> oh Lord, please help me, Jesus. Help me preach your word, Almighty God. Yeah, this life is yours. Let everything I say and do be to glorify. You, Jesus, Jesus, cause he is good, and though none go with me, I still go, because if God is for me, who really cares who's against me? Cause one person in Christ is the majority. A million devils and one person who cries wins every time. Every time. You guys are amazing. Oh, they're, they're really good. I don't get to do this ever. You have no idea. This is really a treat. It is. Preach the gospel, sing the gospel. It's just all the gospel. You guys all right? Yes. Some of you are like, <laughs> 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 So my girlfriend, she stayed with me.
for nine years. My daughter was seven and a half years old. And in that nine year period, I had 30 jobs that we could count. I quit or got fired from everyone. I ripped us off, I ran up our credit cards, I stole from us, I stole from her family, I stole from my family. I robbed my daughter's piggy bank, I stole her city bonds, I did whatever I could to get mine. Sorry, tripping her boutique. Whatever I could to get mine, that's how I lived my life. And nine years later, I come home and she's gone. Now, I told her I'd kill her if she ever left, but I knew that she didn't leave me for somebody, and I knew that I'm just done. So I was going to drive over to her stepdad's house and I was going to get a rifle to shoot myself and end my life. And on the way to the gun cabinet, I passed by a phone book and I flipped it open and it opened to churches. Now, I didn't pick it. It opened to churches. I went, what? And I made a check at one of these churches with a black Sharpie pen. I remember it. And I, I didn't even, I just went, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like that. And I drove to this church. I was so mad. I get to the building. I said, I need to talk to somebody. This real happy guy. <laughs> he said, hey, buddy. Can I help you? I go, I'm not your buddy. He said, well, can I help you? I said, yeah, I need to talk to somebody. He goes, come on, let's go. So I follow him upstairs, sit down. And I said, Rrr. I told him all my stuff. He looks at me and he goes, okay. He said, let me tell you about Jesus. I said, I'm not here. I didn't come here to hear about Jesus. He said, this is a church. <laughs> but in my mind, Jesus didn't exist in a church. That was a hideout. That was people that needed a crutch to get through life. That's what I thought. I didn't realize that he was the anchor of a soul. I thought he was a crutch for people to lean on in time of need. Crutch, you need a crutch. I don't need no crutch. Guys, that's what I thought. I didn't realize he was the anchor of the soul. See, the anchor of your soul, your soul isn't what gets beamed up out of here. People think your soul, no, your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. Jesus is the anchor of your mind, your will, your emotions. He anchors your soul. You are spirit, soul, and body. You have a body, you have a spirit, you have a soul. Your soul needs to be fixed up. Your soul needs to be completely renewed. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what God's will is. That's the Bible. That's what Jesus said. So our mind is twisted and whacked, and we need to get it fixed. And the only way we get it fixed is by submission to the truth, by the spirit of truth that reveals all truth, so that we can know the truth, and the truth can set us free. But I'm talking to him, and he's like, man, he goes, you just told me how you wanted to end your life. You just came from a, you were going to shoot yourself. You came here. Why do you think you're here? I don't know why I'm here. So, well, you don't want your life anymore. Why don't you give it to somebody that does? And I said, who would want my life? He said, Jesus. I said, man, how could a dead guy want my life? Come on, man. It's just a book. He went, Phew. And there was something inside of his eyes that was completely transforming. I was totally rocked and couldn't hardly look in his eyes. He knew the love of God. He knew the love of God. He lived the love of God. He spoke the love of God. He knew the word of God with the spirit of God together as one. And the anointing was on what he said. And I was like, fine, whatever. Why don't you give you like, okay, fine, he can have it. There, I did it. Whatever. That was my prayer. He said, amen. <laughs> Crazy. I didn't even realize what had happened. What I did find out right away is that I didn't want to kill myself anymore. That suicide thing left me. I didn't want to. And I thought, man, everything's changed. Everything's different. This is amazing. Wow, thank you, man. Here's my number. You're going to need it. Why? Because I want you to call me. I said, all right. All right, I got to call my girl. Oh. I went home and I said, and I knew where they were because my daughter left a note. I said, you need to tell mommy that daddy found God. She said, what's he like, dad? I said, I don't know. And it hit me. I had no idea. But I saw him in this guy. I saw him in this guy. I saw his eye. See, the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is single, your whole body's full of light. 
But if your eyes are not single and the light that is in you is darkness, man, how great is that darkness? You have the capacity to house light. We can't afford to think and house darkness. So she came home. She was, I can't believe that you told your daughter that you found God. Come on. There is no God. Yeah, I'm telling you, I saw him in the sky. And I'm going to have to say, shut up. I hate you. Get out of my face. That was our relationship. That's what my daughter witnessed for seven and a half years straight. I'm telling you, things are different. We went to bed that night. I'm sleeping on the couch, of course. And all of a sudden, I get this, I get this urge. I gotta go get my cocaine. I don't have enough money. Wait a minute. The debit card, I think we have some money in our account. Where is it? Where'd you hide? Where'd you hide? I get it, I go out. Same thing, again. 4.30 in the morning, I come back. Girlfriend, daughter on the couch. First night. I love to tell you that everything changed, but it didn't. It got worse. Now I'm out there smoking crack and can't believe that I'm doing this. I hate it. For the first time in my life, I hate it. I didn't know anybody before that, but it's like something changed. I didn't know what it was. It was called conviction. And I hated it. And even though I knew that I didn't want to do it, I still did it. And I will not to, but I didn't understand the reality of the gospel. I didn't know what I gave my life to, and I had no idea. See, you come to Jesus. Jesus says, come to you, all who are weary and burdened down and weighed down by life. Come to me, and I'll give you rest, he says. So people come to him, but then they don't follow through and they don't learn from him. They come to him and they get immediate rest. And all of a sudden they don't realize what they've given themselves to. And they never spend any time in communion with him. And they don't learn from him. His burden is light. His yoke is easy. And they don't. Learning from him is what makes you keep rest and find rest for your soul. All of a sudden your soul has rest that can never be taken away. And then your warfare is done from a place of rest, and that's where we're supposed to be. But I have no idea, man. So a, a night in, another night, another night, another night, another night, another night, another night. Man, it's horrible. Five and a half months later, I'm still in this place of twistedness. Going to church on Sunday, singing real loud. Without relationship. Looking like I have it all figured out, but inside I'm twisted. It's called hypocrisy, and that was me. So five and a half months later, I go out in town again. I don't have any money left. We drained our bank account. We have nothing. I go in to call my dealer. I went to the payphone, and I turned around to my girlfriend and my daughter had followed me in town. And I said, mm. dealer's not home. I will phone up. Daddy, you promised. So I promised her every day, I'll never do it again, I'll never do it again, I'll never do it again, I'll never do it again. Again I did it, again I did it, again I did it, again I did it. And I lived this place of constant conviction and not obeying my conviction. So condemnation constantly ran in my soul. And that's where lots of Christians live. He paid a price to set us free. And I have a key that will set you free. So I lost it. Down the back streets, and I picked up some kid from New York City. I said, Do you have anything on you? And he handed me a bunch of drugs, and I got it in my hand. I said, You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used against you. And I read him his rights, and I told him I was a cop. He said, I knew you were a cop. I knew it. And I pulled over, and I got him out of the car. I said, Get out of the car, put your hands on the hood. What he did, I went, To get away. He unloaded a nine millimeter at me and a voice filled my vehicle. And the voice said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? <laughs> to me, that's mercy. You know what I did? You'd think, you'd just, oh God, no, no. I smoked every bit of cocaine that I stole from that kid. And all night long, that voice killed my buzz. He wouldn't let me get high. I took those bullets for you. Are you ready yet? You have to be ready. Are you ready yet? It wasn't, you must be ready. It's, are you ready yet? I took those for you. I love you. I took those bullets for you. All night long, torment inside of my head. 
went home, shined a flashlight on my vehicle, not one bullet hole in my car. Ten feet away. That is mercy. I went up to my door, my girlfriend is on the couch with my daughter. Get out of my life, I hate you. I said, I gotta go. Get out. Daddy! And I left and I went to a place three days later called Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge is a Christian rehab. I have no idea what it is. All I know is that I need to be free and it's a year long. So I go into this program, man. I submit. I submit to God because that's where it's at. See, resistance of the devil in your own strength is fruitless and useless and you cannot beat him. He will kill you. He will pin you to the ground and he laughs at your rebuke. He laughs at you when you rebuke him and tell him to get behind you. The Bible doesn't say rebuke the devil and command him to get behind you. The Bible says he already is behind you. But if you don't use the weapons of your warfare, the reality of who he says you are, you have no ammo, you have nothing to fight with. You can't just tell the devil to shut up because he won't shut up. He'll keep coming at you. Jesus said, my sheep will hear and obey my voice, but a stranger's they will not follow. You have to know the shepherd's voice and the stranger's voice. Because when you know the shepherd's voice, the stranger's voice smells funny. I promise you. So I'm in this place, two months into it, I have to leave. My girlfriend is so glad I'm out of her life. I messed up everything. They were going to share sale my house three days after I left. She has to pick up all the garbage from me. I tormented everything. Her mom is glad I'm out of her life. Her brother's glad. My mom, oh, I hope this works. You know, all that. I don't have Christians in my family. None. I don't come from a line of Christians. I don't come from that. I'm the first one. Really? First one in my, in, in, my, in my girl's family, too. They don't have any. It is awesome. What a good place. What a place to leave a legacy. So I'm in there, man, and it is, is rough because I'm getting in the Bible and I can't read. So every time I open the book, it's like my brain is going. I have no idea what I'm reading because I have a comprehension problem. I can't understand anything I read. So my whole life, for 34 years, I've never read a book ever. So the Bible is the first book that I've ever read in my whole life. Ever. And I didn't even read the whole thing yet. <laughs> How can you be preaching? <laughs> Jesus didn't tell you to memorize the scriptures. He told you to become them. Come on. The only word you really know is the one you can walk out. He won't tell me you know the word unless you can walk it out. Ouch. <laughs> Yet good. Because I was a poor memorizer. The Bible, the Word gets in there, and God, man, He separates your soul from your spirit. The Word of God is alive and sharp and active, separating this thing from this thing, separating the joint from the marrow. And then He divides the thoughts and intents of the heart, and He goes into your heart. <laughs> He does. He's good at it. It's like Jesus when he came into the temple. And he found them doing things they weren't supposed to. And he started ripping up stuff and flipping the tables, man. And that's what he does to your heart. <laughs> flipping the tables of the money changers. Get out of here. You made my father's house a marketplace. It's to be a house of prayer. That's what Jesus does to your temple when you give him permission. Be careful. What if he comes in and flips that thing upside down, inside out? He doesn't just come in and put up new wallpaper. That's not how it works, man. He comes in. Do, 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 do. Are you okay? Just having fun. So I'm in there for two months, man. I have these three dreams, three nights in a row. I get these tormenting nightmares every night that I'm in there. And then I have these three dreams. And the one dream I'm in, I'm in this valley in my dream. And, and I, it starts to shake. And I, and, I, and I hear a voice. And I'm scared because in my dreams I have night terrors. Like every night when I'm in there. 
I hear a voice say, do not fear, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I woke up right before my alarm went off. See, every morning, an hour before the day started, I would go inside the prayer room and open my Bible, even though I didn't understand anything. I mean, if you can't read a regular book, when you open the Bible, it's like, <clears throat> what? <laughs> oh, help. It's a different language. It's like a different language. It don't matter if it's King James and NIV, the New Living Translation, it's a different language. Because it's not meant for your brain, it's meant for your heart. Because in the Bible, your heart can take you places your brain can't fit. So I'm in there, I go in the prayer room and I open it, I just flip it open, just like I did the phone book that day, and it opened to Psalm 23. And I read it, and I'm like, okay. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm like, oh, oh my God. That was my dream. I was in the valley. I shall fear no evil. Oh! I shall. Oh God. Is that you talking to me? Is that you? Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. I'm in between both of them. <laughs> I want it all, man. So I went about my day, didn't tell anybody. Next night, same dream, same thing, same valley. And I went and opened the Bible, same thing. It didn't even have a bookmark in it. Same thing, Psalm 23. I heard a voice. Do not fear, I'll never leave you, I'll forsake you. Okay, this time I told some people, they said, be careful, man. What are you going to do? You going to leave? How do you know it's Jesus? You're in trouble, man. No, no, no. I'm telling you. I'm not leaving. I just, I just think Jesus is trying to talk to me. Third night. Have the same dream this time, a light shines down the valley. I'm afraid to turn around. I don't know what's back there. I hit my knees. And somebody put their hand on my shoulder and said, do not fear, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. This addiction will never touch you again, go home. Now I'm 10 months early and I quit everything in my whole life. I never followed through with anything. But something reverberated through my whole life, like this relationship. Not a confession about one. The reality of one hit my soul. And the reality of Jesus permeated my whole being. And I got up out of the prayer room. Because I went down there, opened the 23rd Psalm, got up out of the prayer room, went down to my room and packed all my stuff. And I called that pastor. His name's Dan Moeller. I called him, I said, man, the, 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 the nice guy I saw in the church that day. I said, I need you to come get me, man, right now. He said, Todd, is this God? I said, I met Jesus last night. He said, I'm on my way. And he comes to get me. Man, the counselors let me have it because this is a 12-month program. And I understand. The last guy that left before me from that same facility died of an overdose in two weeks. So he came to pick me up and he took me to my house so I could tell my daughter how sorry I was because for the first time in my whole life, I realized that I was a dad. That wasn't a dad, but right now in my life, my daughter came running across the porch and I said, hey, you? She said, daddy. I said, that's right, I'm your dad. She looked at me, she goes, I'm so glad you're home. Problem. I said, honey, daddy's not home. Daddy's out and I'm so sorry for what I've done to you. She was daddy for what? I said, all the times, all the whole life, all the addiction, everything in my life. Daddy, what are you talking about? I'm just glad you're home. She's seven and a half. I'm her only dad. But for the first time in my life, I realized that she's my girl. She's my daughter. Oh, that's amazing. No, 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 no. That's amazing. And I'm holding her, telling her I'm going to provide for her. She doesn't know what any of that stuff is. I'm telling her how sorry I am. My girlfriend comes out of the house and I said, I'm so sorry for all that I've done. I'm going to provide for her and I'm going to show you what it means to have a provider for her. I'm going to take care of her. I'm sorry. She says, I know you are. I said, what do you mean you know I am? She said, when you went away, I gave my life to Jesus. I said, I said what's going on I looked at Dan. He goes, I've been talking to them when you've been gone. 
And then, oh my God. I said, I, I'm so convicted in my heart. So convicted in my heart of all the junk and all the sin and all the trash and all my house and how it's filled with pornography and all the drugs and all the paraphernalia and all the stuff, the growing lights to grow weed in my closet, all that junk. All the roaches, all the seeds, all the junk, all the porn books, all the DVDs, all the VHSs, all that junk is in my house, and my heart it is pounding because I can't believe that it's in there. I'm not tempted that I'm going to use it. I'm convicted that i got to get rid of it. Like the goodness of God and the mercy of God hit my soul, and I know that it's not right for it to be in there. I look at my girl and I said, I, I, I'm so sorry. What's going on right now? I said, I cannot live here. I'm convicted that I cannot and will not move back in again because we are not in covenant. And God, in two months period of time, ridiculously rearranged my heart and showed me that he's in a covenant with me that he'd never break. And husbands and wives, that's a covenant thing. But we're not in covenant. We're just in a fornication relationship. And I'm convicted, not because of the wrong of it, but convicted of my relationship with God that I can't do that to violate this. It's an amazing the goodness of God that's leading my heart to repentance. Now I'm not doing that because I got this. I'm not being mean, I'm being in love. <laughs> and I said, I cannot live there. She goes, no, you can't. She goes, we need to be married. I said, oh my God. I said, well. he said, Dan looks me he <laughs> if you know him, if you know what I'm talking about, you'd know. He just, he's just full of love. He'd been talking about, my, about the reality of what I was coming home like. He had faith in the reality of God's ability to fix me. Because I submitted to God and the devil's resisted my submission to the king. Well, I looked at him. I said, man, we got a plan. We're going to plan this. He goes, you're not planning nothing. I said, no. I said, what do you mean? He goes, no, no, no. Uh uh, I know that you love her and I know that she loves you because I've been talking to her. We're not planning anything. We will do it on Sunday in between first and second service. <laughs> so my girl and I got married four days later in between first and second service at church. <laughs> that was 11 years ago, October 24th. I have been a Christian. For 11 years. Right now. 11. 11. I was an atheist and a drug addict. And I was a hypocrite for five and a half months. But then Jesus set me free from me. We got married. Now, my youngest daughter, she's four. We have a middle daughter who's nine. And then my oldest daughter, our oldest daughter, who's 18. My 18 year old has zero memory of any of the drug addiction, of any, drug, of any job loss. Don't try to psychologically explain this. It is called the blood of Jesus that cleanses your conscience from dead works in order to serve the living God. Jesus is Lord and I promise you there is hope for you. Can you play? Listen. I know, it's so good. It is. It's amazing. There's hope. The key is Jesus. The key is surrender. The key is full surrender. The key is not, I'm just going to get my feet wet. That's not the key. The key is you're going to jump in full on. The key is not holding back. The key is jumping in. The key is not holding back. i share a testimony with you. I was here in your town. Right here, in your town. <clears throat> I think it was I think it was two years ago. I don't know, I've been here like a bunch, like five times. Or six. I don't know. A bunch. Yeah. Been here a bunch. And and there was this buddy of mine. Is Mike here? Yeah. Yay, I'll talk about that. Is it good? We'll talk about this testimony. Yeah, it's so good. So Mike's like, hey man, I want you to come to my church. I go, all right, cool. What your pastor think about that? I don't know. So he went and showed him a video. The pastor's like, absolutely not. <laughs> and it's okay. Because like I said, people aren't my problem. Really. 
So that was, a, that was a year and a half before that. So then I come into town a year and a half later. This is two years ago. And I'm doing this conference. Um, I think I was at uh, Centenary Church. And we're doing this conference there. And it's a Saturday morning. And this pastor comes. And he's like, hey, you can see if Todd will go out to lunch with me. I'm like, of course I go out to lunch with you. So we went out to lunch. I said, you pick the restaurant and just go. I just want to get a salad somewhere. So we go out to a place called McAllister's. Savannah salad, baby. They got good food. So we go there on a Saturday. Sunday, our Saturday, it's packed. College kids and all that, you know. So we go there and, and on the way down the sidewalk, we park the car and I'm with uh, Pastor and his son is in town and we're walking down and I see the security guard and I look at him and I said, hey man. I said, how long have you been a security guard? And he goes, well, I was a police officer for 21 years. I said, no way. See, when I see police officers, I gotta share my testimony. Because I was in their backseat a lot. <laughs> I was. I do, I stick my head in cop cars. Hey, no, no, no. <laughs> I just wanna share something with you. I share it with customs officers. I, sh I share it with airport security. I share it with police officers. I share it with FBI agents. I share it with CIA agents. I share it with everybody, especially law enforcement, because your heart becomes hard. Because you see all the junk and you never see the other side. So I'm trying to tell this guy, man, and then I was like a cop car. And the pastor's son doesn't know my testimony. So he's like, oh my God. Wow, you really were bad. Wow, well, that's just. He cut me off because the guy goes, whatever, and he walks away. I said, I'm telling you, man, Jesus is real. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we walk down the sidewalk, and we walk in there, and I walk, walk past the liquor store, right on the way to McAllister's. There's a guy sitting out front, and he's just sitting there holding his head. So I figured, this dude's got a headache. It's obvious. So I said to him, I said, man, you got a headache? He goes, yeah, it's killing me. I said, can I pray for you? He goes, nah, I'm okay. I said, nonsense, dude. In the name of Jesus, we command his headache to go right now. And his manager's out there smoking a cigarette. She's like, <laughs> right? For real. <laughs> Pastor's with me. Pastor's not on page with all this. And that's okay. It doesn't matter if he is. I am. Jesus is. I, I am not victim to your unbelief. See, tonight in here, God's going to do miracles and heal people because he can. And if you don't believe it, you might get healed anyway. It won't matter. You don't have to believe. I don't need you to be in faith. I don't need you to believe. Jesus is bigger than all that. Amen. Hey man, do you have anything going on with your shoulder? You with a white hat. Yeah. Anything going on with a rotator cuff? Yes or no? No? Okay. Nothing up in this area at all. Okay. Someone right next to you. I can't see really. Okay, here we go. Problem with the neck and shoulder, right on the right side. Where are you? He's right around that guy, right there behind you. Is that you? Problem with your neck and shoulder? Okay, right behind your white hat. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> it's okay. No, you, you can do this. Here, why don't you just hold her hand? In Jesus' name. I command that disc to be healed right now. Herniated disc to be healed in Jesus' name right now. Right now. Let her go. Get out in Jesus' name. I command you to be healed in Jesus' name. God loves you so much. Move your neck around. Yay. What's it doing? Is it better? He's a really good God. Jesus, Jesus paid a price to forgive our sin. He also paid a price to heal our body. It's healing and forgiveness. Don't get it messed up. They lowered the guy through the roof to get to Jesus in Mark 2. They lowered the paralytic through the roof. He comes through the roof. They lowered him to be healed. And Jesus looks at him and said, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. They're like, we didn't bring him to be forgiven, dude. We brought him to be healed. It's obvious they didn't bring him. And Jesus knew that they reasoned, they reasoned in their hearts. And he said, which is more important? Which is better to say? That your sins are forgiven? Or to pick up your mat and walk? But that you should know that the Son of Man, Jesus, paid a price. The Son of Man came. 
that you should know. He said that he came for forgiveness of sins. Pick up your mat and walk. And the guy got healed. Why? Because Jesus was showing that what was coming through the Holy Spirit after Jesus was crucified and resurrected because having believed unto righteousness dashed by his stripes, you are healed. He was showing the correlation between forgiveness and healing. It's one covenant. We take communion. Why? We eat the bread. Why? See, if it was just about forgiveness and just about, just about our forgiveness of sins, we just drink the juice. It would be a lopsided covenant. Don't cut half the book out because you're uncomfortable. Realize that you're, you're required to be uncomfortable to have the comforter show up. It's just the gospel. You have no idea how many people have come and just pastors and people are like, I don't believe any of that. They get healed anyway because Jesus loves them. I'm not like a weird guy. I just believe the whole book. I didn't rip out pages that I'm uncomfortable with. I'm, I mean, I've read the, as much of the book as I've read. <laughs> I spend the majority of my time in the New Testament because I need to know who I am in Christ before I read the old. Because when I read the new, I need to come into the old, but I need to see Jesus in the old. I can't just read the old without the new. Or I'll be under the law. And I can't be under the law because I'm not under the law. I'm under the law of liberty, which is the law of love, the royal law of love, the reality of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. There's nobody that can test this at all, except for people that are raised saying that miracles aren't for today. And God's just, he's not insecure. He's okay with you thinking that because he'll heal you regardless because he loves you. That's amazing. You were like, he's really getting weird now. No, I just believe the truth and your unbelief will not trump my belief. I promise. He loves you. So I'm, the guy, he goes, what the blank did you just do? Can you imagine? His headache got healed and he cussed me out. <laughs> what the blank did you do? I didn't tell you to blank and pray for me. What is, is your headache gone? Yeah, what the blank's going on? I said, Jesus loves you, bro. See, his heart's not cleaned up. So out of your heart, your mouth speaks. You get this thing fixed and everything changes here. It's the Bible. Come on. It's good. So the lady looks at me. I said, you got two herniated discs. She goes, yeah, pray for me. <laughs> so we pray for her. Me, the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus. And pray for her. She bends over. She goes, thank you. Gives me a big hug. I said, isn't this awesome? I said, were you about to go home? He goes, yeah, man, I was out of here. I said, isn't it cool that God would heal your employee? That he doesn't have to go home from work now? Isn't that awesome? And he worked at the liquor store. She goes, that is awesome. Get to work. I said, Jesus loves you so much. The guy goes, can I have a couple minutes to hurry? She goes, yeah. She walks in. I said, man, I got to go to a restaurant right now and go eat, but I'll be back, okay? He goes, all right, man. What is going on? I said, Jesus loves you so much, man. So we walk, and the pastor looks at me, he goes, that was cool. <laughs> so we go in the door, and we walk in, and we're standing in line, and I turn around, and, and there's these people behind me, and this one girl, she has a tattoo of a butterfly right here on her collarbone. I can see the leaf. I go, is that a butterfly? She goes, yeah. I go, I'm a butterfly. <laughs> see, I was a caterpillar. And then Jesus came into my life and renewed my mind. And it's like metamorphosis. I was a caterpillar, now I'm a butterfly. I'm a new creation. Don't even look like anything I used to. She goes, you're a freak. I said, I am. But he loves you. She goes, okay, I'm done. I said, all right, God loves you so much. The pastor's like, his son is like, <sighs> We're standing in line. I turn around. There's a guy behind her with a cell phone. I go, hey man, he loves you. To get his, to get out of the way. You know how. One of them things. But he loves you, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, all right. Bless you. God loves you guys so much. He does. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. She's getting upset a little bit. All right, it's okay. So we get to the cash register and tell the lady that Jesus loves her so much. You're amazing. You can tell everybody that Jesus loves them because regardless of their life or not, Jesus paid a price for them. You don't get to pick and choose. He loves everybody. And if they have an encounter with that love, if you have an encounter with it, you'll be changed. Because it's the love of God that transforms. So, 
We go to our seat. I set down the salad on the table and I hear in my heart, go to the ATM and withdraw $100 out of your personal bank account and give it to that girl with the butterfly. So I run out the door. Pastor goes, what are you doing? I said, I'll be right back. So I run up the, up the store and, and the guy's still outside. I said, you don't got a headache still. He was, I, he was, no, it's gone, man. Can you please tell me what's going on? I said, I will, man, but I got a mission right now. I got to do I'll be back. I run up to the drugstore. I go to the ATM. I withdraw money. I run back down. I said, dude, I'll be back. Just don't go anywhere. Your boss ain't going to let you leave. She knows you're healed anyway. So the guy's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I run down to the store. I walk in. And I walk, up, walk in. And, and that girl's sitting at the table with all those kids. Like three of them. Three other ones are her. I walk up to her and I said, hey. She goes, what? I said, I need to see your hand. She goes, why? I said, I need to give you something. And I put that money in her hand. And I told her, the Lord told me to tell you that he's not a thief. And right then, God revealed to me that she had just lost somebody in her family. And she believed that God stole them from her. She went, oh. She looked at her friend. Her friend burst into tears because they were just talking about that amount of money that she needed to pay a bill that day. And I said, he loves you so much. And they're like, oh, my God, let's go. And this girl got up, <laughs> ran out the door. Girl with a butterfly. She flew away. Gone. <laughs> so I said, he loves you guys so much. And the kids got to up again. Because he don't want to hear it. He doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he wasn't hearing it or not. I got to tell him. Better yet, I got to demonstrate. It doesn't say study to preach yourself approved. It says study to show yourself approved. That's different. I don't study my Bible to preach. I study my Bible to show. Why? Because I need to demonstrate the reality of Jesus Christ on this earth. To be an imitator of God. A bunch of you right now have neck problems. Just put your hand on your neck right now. In the name of Jesus right now, we command every neck to be loosed. In Jesus' name, necks be healed right now. Every disc, every bit of pain, every muscle, every tendon, every ligament in the neck right now. Every headache, get out right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for wholeness right now. In Jesus' name, right now. Move your neck around. Just move it around. If there's change, wave your hand in the air right now. Again, put your hand on your neck. In Jesus' name, we command every bit of pain to go. Every bit of nerve problem. In Jesus' name, I command tingling in the fingers to leave right now. In Jesus' name. Right now. Jesus' name. Pain, get out. In Jesus' name. Hey, one of you girls leaving. Are you leaving or are you coming back? Okay. <laughs> Check your neck right now. Just check. Check and see. If the pain left, wave your hand in the air. pressure issue, but it's a problem with the heart. Just raise your hand. You shouldn't have it because you're young. How, how old are you? How old? Come on. Put your hand right here. In Jesus' name. There's a fear thing inside of you because this thing runs in your family. It stops today. Right now. God, I thank you for a brand new heart in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, for doctors confirming this in Jesus' name. Is your chest warm right now? 
Is it warm? Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Are you a Christian? Yes, sir. Okay. If you're not, you should be. I can't see. I wish I could. Bless you, man. Stand up right now. Is there anybody up there I can't see? I'm blind right now. I mean, I'm, I can see, but that light is serious. Is he here? Okay. In Jesus' name. Someone, listen. Somebody has something on. Is it, is it cancer in here? Yes? You. You that stood. Are you standing because I have cancer? Are you standing because you want to pray for this? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Where? Is it in this area? Yeah. Is it prostate? Jesus name get out cancer I curse you and command you to get out of this house in Jesus name right now every bit of every bit of pain every bit of pressure every bit of skin be healed prostate you be healed right now in Jesus name Thank you, Father. Wow. If you've got a relative right now that has cancer, just put your hand up right now. Jesus' name, we command every one of them to be healed right now. In the name of Jesus, we curse cancer and we command it to go right now. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. That it would be completely annihilated, taken out right now in Jesus' name. We command it to go now. Father, I thank you that relatives will confirm in the name of Jesus that this will be gone in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, I, I rarely ever have that thing like that. That was aggressive. You'll see. You'll see fruit from it. You know what? He talks a big talk. Oh, you'll see fruit from it. Come on, then what will you do? Then what will you do with that? You better be praying for people. Come on, man. Change your life so you can change others' lives. Can we keep the lights like that so I can see everybody? Are we okay? It's okay? Thank you, Jesus. You have no idea. I'm sitting there going, how do you see people? He said, he really is awesome. Wow. Our, waiter, our waitress comes over. Her name is Faith. I said, oh my gosh, for real? Your name is Faith? She goes, yeah. I go, I live by Faith. She goes, okay. Do you guys want something to drink? Or... <laughs> yeah, I do. I'll take some water. You know God loves you so much. Okay, all right. No, no, no. Faith, do you have a lot of pain in your body? She goes, yeah, I'm a waitress. How long have you been a waitress? A long time. It's the, it's the, it comes with the territory. It's not okay. It's not okay. Can I pray for you? No, really, I'm okay. Please let me pray for you. And we pray for her. And she almost falls down. I don't need people to fall down. But sometimes, sometimes it happens. She's riddled with it. And I said, check your body. She goes, oh my God, that's awesome. And she walks away. And you know what God said? Go up to the ATM. I want you to withdraw another $100 out of your bank account. Yeah. And I want you to give it to her and tell her that I love her. So I ran out and I said, what are you doing? The pastor said, I said, see you. I ran out the restaurant. 
Imagine if he's that good. Imagine if he told you to give like that. Imagine if God so loved the world that he... What if he created you in his image to be a giver? And I'm not saying that for an offering. I'm saying that so your life can become one. What if the church should be known as a radically generous church that wants to rock people and love people and give and bless people? Come on. That's really who he's called us to be. So I ran up there, came back in. I come in, got this money. Faith comes up. I put it in her hands. She goes, no, you don't understand. No, I can't take this. I said, you have to take this. She goes, why are you doing this? I said, because do you believe I hear God? She goes, well, I said, do you believe that God told me that you're riddled with pain? She goes, yeah. I said, you're pain free now. She goes, yeah. Do you think that I did it? No. Do you think he did? Yeah. You don't understand. This is my last day of work. I got fired. I go, no way. She goes, yeah. She goes, I had an argument with the boss, and, and it was just really ugly, and I had two weeks, and this is my last day. I don't have a job tomorrow. I said, isn't it amazing that God knew that? Blessed you because of it? She goes, this is crazy. I said, I need to talk to your boss. She goes, no. She ran me back. I got up and I went and found her boss. I said, hey, I have a question for you. He goes, yeah. I said, I just want to tell you what an amazing waitress you have in faith. She's doing a great job today. And that's only a reflection of management. Well done. He goes, are you serious? I said, I am so serious. Good job, sir. It's awesome. Well, thank you. We don't get comments like that. I said, what you did today? Bless you, man. That's all I want to say. God loves you so much. Well, thank you, sir. Went back to the table. Faith is like, what did you say to him? I just told him you were awesome. What? <laughs> what a day. And the girls come. She comes over, she goes to the bathroom, I say, hey, from that table, I said, I need to talk to you. She comes over, she goes, what's going on? I said, you have a problem in your neck and in your back? She goes, yeah. She goes, you have an aura. I said, thank you. <laughs> she doesn't know what she's looking at. It's Jesus that she's seeing. She's seeing the Holy Spirit. I'm not playing a game with this thing. She doesn't understand, but I'm not going to be offended by what she says. She doesn't know what she's saying. I need to tell her what she's seeing. No, honey, what you're seeing is light. You're seeing light, right? Yeah, colors like blue. Blue is like revelation. I carry Jesus. He is light. And I have him in me. Therefore, I'm a light in a dark place. Can I pray for you? Okay. <laughs> so we pray. Jesus heals her completely. It was so good. God loves you so much. The pastor said Another girl comes up, she's standing right beside me, hooked on my side. This is what she's doing. In the restaurant. She's manifesting a devil in the restaurant. And, and that girl with the butterfly is in the door. She's standing right beside pastor, right behind the pastor. The girl beside me is, I said, honey, you're okay. I said, you're gonna be all right. And that girl, her name's Kelly with the butterfly. You're not here, are you? Oh God, that would be amazing. That would just be like you. No more. I said, you're going to be all right, honey. I said, she's going to be okay. All right. I said, honey, I said, you, you lost your daughter, I said, to addiction, haven't you? She was like, I said, you're going to give your life to Jesus today. God's going to get your daughter back. It's a hostile situation. Imagine that. What if that happened in your life? What if you walked in a restaurant and it happened? I promise you, I've seen it on planes, in restaurants, in dentist's office, in doctor's office, in malls. I've watched people throw up in trash cans in malls, get delivered, shake, rattle, roll, all nine yards. Why? Because Jesus lives in me and he wants out. The Holy Spirit lives in me and he wants out. And it's every believer's privilege to be able to cast out devils. So this girl gets born again. This thing gets cast out. She falls into me. The Holy Spirit lands on her, hits her, and hits Kelly. The pastor got up in the meantime. He goes, this thing's leaving you. He's there praying with me. The pastor that didn't believe in all this, right there. He said, in the name of Jesus. Why? Because you can't just sit there. This is all scripture being active.
it out in front of you. It's like the book of Acts. It's like the gospel. It's the power of God. It's the gospel. It's Jesus. He's good. God wants to heal people. But first things first. If you're in here and you have not sold out and surrendered your life, I need you up right now out of your seat. Come on. It's time. I got one. I got two. Come on, two. You're kidding me, right? There's got to be more. If there was that many, your streets would be full of people walking. Come on. Come on. If you have not surrendered and sold out, it's time right now. It's go time. Let's not be afraid. Come on. Why would you be ashamed? Why would you just say, come on, Jesus. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. Come on. Who else? Who else would be brave enough? This man ran down here. Who else would be brave enough to say, I'm in. I'm totally in. If that's you, run down here right now. Don't sit in your seat. Get down here right now. Come on. You're up there. Get down here. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't you let fear hold you in your seat. Let's crush hell together. Come on. So Come on. Come on. Come on, if that's you, run down here. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's time to burn. It's time to be on fire. It's time to have Jesus light us on fire. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, uh. Jesus is going to rock your world. You're going to change the world. Come on. Is that it? For real? For real? Yeah, come on. Jesus. You should be up here if you've never given your life to Jesus. Now's the time. Now's the time to come and burst into flames and let the whole world watch you burn. Right now. If that's you, get up here. Let's do this. Come on. Don't let fear hold you in your seat. Don't let shame hold you in your seat. Let's get this thing on with Jesus. Come on. Some of you are sitting there going, I don't know. When are you going to know? Why would you have to have tragedy push you, push you to majesty? Why do we have to have something really bad happen in order for us to realize that Jesus is what we really need? Come on. Let's stop playing church and let's burn and be on fire. Let's stop playing. Let's do this. Come on. Come on, if that's you, get down here. Jesus. Come on. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Jesus, Jesus. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. Sweet Jesus. How many of you down here are first time saying, I am giving my whole life to Jesus right now? So all of you are just, I'm just done living for me and I'm going to burn for Jesus. <laughs> Come on. It's awesome. It's the only way to live. Otherwise, you'll be a product of your environment instead of influencing it. And it's time to change our environment. Come on. Is there anybody else that would say they should be down here? I know people would be like, I'll just sit here. God knows where I'm at. That's not what I asked you. I asked you to make a move. Jesus. Father, I thank you right now. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you. Free!
today, we make a fresh commitment to you to burn on fire in the name of Jesus, God. I thank you, Father, for a fresh infilling and overflow with the fire of heaven. In Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in the name of Jesus, God. I ask you to touch your people. Touch your people, God. Not just people standing, but people sitting that didn't come forward. God, I thank you for an overwhelming, overwhelming baptism of fire for everyone that came in this house. In the name of Jesus, God, that we will burn and let the whole world watch us burn. 